Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today uh, on this special panel discussion sponsored by QBI. Uh, my name is Tejal Desai, and I am Chair and Professor of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences at UCSF. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here with a distinguished group of scientists and uh, leaders within academia and NIH uh, to talk about this important issue. And today, we really hope to shine light on the barriers that minority scientists, particularly black scientists, face around funding disparities. And furthermore, really discuss tangible action items that can help us foster a more optimal climate and framework around equity and inclusion um, in the biosciences through federal funding. In a recent cell commentary paper co-authored by 18 distinguished biomedical scientists and engineers, um, two in this panel that will be introduced shortly, uh, authors called for NIH to recognize systemic racism and to really take action to bring about equitable distribution of grant funding. For example, while efforts have been made to encourage black students to enter careers as researchers and faculty, once appointed, the lack of research funding can stifle and be very detrimental on careers, especially their ability to garner support through NIH and other federal funding sources. And this has important ramifications for the field and science at large. So it is my hope that we can uh, engage in a dialogue to learn more about where we are today and where we can be uh, as we move forward. So let me begin by introducing our panelists. Today, we have the pleasure of um, having some amazing uh, individuals. Uh, first, let me introduce my colleagues from the engineering uh, field. Uh, we first have Dr. Hana El Samad, professor in biochemistry and biophysics at UCSF. Secondly, we have Dr. Lola Eniola Adefeso, Professor of Chemical Engineering, Biomedical Engineering, and Macromolecular Science and Engineering from the University of Michigan. From NIH, we have Dr. Noni Burns, Director of the Center for Scientific Review at the NIH. And finally, we have Dr. Marie Bernard, Acting Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity at NIH. Thank you so much for joining us here today. So first, um, let me start with uh, Lola. Uh, can you talk about the origins of the movement, how um, this issue came to light? Uh, I know it's an issue that actually has had a longstanding uh, uh, visibility, but uh, really hasn't had much action um, over the, the last decade or so. And perhaps you can talk about how it started within the BME community and its uh, growth over these few months. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to say a big thank you to QBI and UCSF for putting this on and, and having uh, given us this platform to, to engage in this dialogue with the NIH. Uh, so the paper, the Fun Black Scientist paper, as you might imagine, based on the authorship, is a collection of uh, work that several of us uh, did over um, the, the end of last year towards the beginning of this year. Uh, and, and the idea behind this conversation started within a, a BME faculty group that existed on, on, on Facebook. Uh, and, and I like to say sometimes <laughs> uh, conversations often is triggered by an, an individual uh, uh, making, uh, starting a conversation, uh, and depending on the mood and, and the people that are, um, are seeing this, you, you end up with a very nice and uh, robust uh, conversation. And this is, by the way, a, a, a BME women faculty group on Facebook. Uh, and we had a colleague, in fact, uh, a co-author on this paper, Dr. Uh, Princess Inmokwede, who's a faculty member at University of Washington, um, in, in, I'm sorry, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, who essentially posted or reposted this uh, decade-old paper that first highlighted the funding disparity between um, black scientists and, and white scientists in NIH R01 application. Uh, and, and her post and, and the rawness of it, it just happened to coincide with a lot of 
feelings that many of us were having uh, on the backdrop of the summer, the unrest that, that was linked to this uh, injustice in the murder of George Floyd. And so there was a nice, robust conversation and many of the women who jumped in um, in the conversation uh, are ended up being uh, co-authors on this paper. I wanna highlight that one of the things that was unique about this, this conversation that we were having was in an immediate pivot from, you know what, this is ridiculous, how can we fix this? Uh, and so there was a, a, a series of conversation and I have to highlight our colleague, uh, Kelly Stevens, who's a faculty member in biomedical engineering at uh, University of Washington, Seattle, who was really the uh, catalyst for moving us from a um, siloed kind of discussion to how about we put this all together and write something about it. And so we moved the conversation to uh, a Slack working group and that's sort of how we ended up uh, uh, generating this publication uh, that we put out to the, to the world. And, you know, as part of uh, also this, this group, uh, one of the things that has been very unique is that this is not just about the paper. Um, you know, there are many subgroups and, and other activities that are going on. Can you talk a little bit about how this has grown into something bigger than let me just put a paper in place? Sure. Uh, so it's an original Slack channel, as I mentioned, uh, was generated by Kelly Stevens. And, and she actually um, had uh, myself and uh, pro uh, Professor uh, Princess Imakwede um, as well as uh, Professor Naomi Tesla, who's a BME faculty at uh, UC System, Irvine, I think. Uh, and so, you know, we invited our colleagues um, to move over from Facebook to join us. And we were stunned by upwards of 200 faculty members jumping in immediately. Um, and that precipitated a monthly conversation again led by the uh, Kelly Stevens and the executive uh, uh, team here uh, in, in essentially starting with, okay, this is not just about funding. This is about the gross underrepresentation of black uh, faculty members and scholars in biomedical engineering research. And here we ha have a real life pandemic that's playing out and the inequities that we were seeing in terms of which communities were disproportionately uh, impacted by this. And so we, it wasn't hard for us to make the connection that as uh, faculty who do biomedical research in academic institution that we were square in the middle and in some ways maybe have contributed to propagating this uh, inequities and injustice that's playing out. And so the uh, conversation on this Zoom calls were really, how do we learn what our roles have been, how do we unlearn many of the things we've learned that tends to propagate um, this kinds of uh, disparity, and how do we then begin to pivot towards action? In what ways can we do better as we move forward? So there are groups within within this uh, uh, Slack group that are focused on different uh, perspective of this issue. Certainly, we all recognize that none of this will work out if we don't push for getting rid of this funding disparity. This is why we continue to uh, push and talk about this. This was why this paper was the first thing out of that group because we deeply uh, believe that this is an important component that needs to happen if everything else we're working on is going to come to fruition. Wonderful. Um, Hannah, you know, one, of, one of the things that I really struck with was that this, paper when it came out um, received a lot of attention, not just within the community, but also was amplified um, throughout many different communities. How, how did that actually happen? And, and can you walk us through that process of um, being able to collectively mobilize to really get the, the message out? Uh, thank you, Tejal. This is an excellent question. And um, it was, uh, so the short answer uh, is that it was all intentional. Uh, so we, as part of, it was an intentional and a community effort within that Slack channel. We had an organizing channel for uh, where we uh, discussed different strategies on how to get the word out. And before the paper appeared, 
uh, there was actually a fleshed out social media strategy uh, to uh, trend the, uh, you know, the fund black scientist hashtag and a plan to, uh, you know, sequentially target audiences so that we can get uh, we can get the paper to the desks and the consciousness of as many people as possible. And here I want to stop actually and, 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 and highlight, a, you know, a number of, of people who made this happen. Kelly, uh, Lola mentioned Kelly Stevens. She was absolutely instrumental. She was the, you know, the, the, the organizer of that document that set us all on track on how to, uh, you know, uh, on how to mount that campaign. But also, uh, you know, the, the younger generation in that, in, in our group were just absolutely instrumental, uh, you know, in this. For example, Ana Maria Porras, who uh, at the time was a postdoc uh, and, and now is moving to her faculty University of Florida. She's, uh, you know, she's a master act in social media, and she uh, told all of us on how to uh, how to tweet, how to be consistent and use consistent language in our tweet. What time of the day do we need to tweet? How often do we need to retweet? Uh, and how not to diffuse the message? So there was a huge art and organization to that, and I'm just so proud of this group for being so disciplined and community oriented, not only in the message that we have out there, but in how to uh, move it forward uh, it, with tools that are, you know, 21st century tools, such as uh, proper use of social media. And can you, you know, what I noticed is that it wasn't just retweeted by um, the authors or those that you might have um, assumed would retweet, but really there were allies that were brought into this mix and, um, you know, advocates across the board, even outside of the sciences. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, again, it has to do with the, the wonderful group of uh, BME faculty that we were working with, who far long before we had uh, the idea of, of uh, promoting this uh, uh, document on social media, who were already engaged in the scientific community as well as social community. And you saw the MC Yama tweeted the paper, and it's because we had members of our group, uh, Professor Abby Coppers, who's a faculty member at uh, Northeastern, happened to have uh, MC Yama in her follower group. Don't ask me how that happened. I, I don't think we got a straight answer, but she was able to actually uh, directly uh, message uh, MC Yama and asked whether he would be interested in tweeting our, our article. And, and, and uh, I have to acknowledge, uh, um, I think it's Maeve the Science Raven is is her name. I apologize deeply if I messed this up. Who is also who's a scientist who's advocate uh, who has an advocacy focused on communicating science to a general audience. So she also has a connection to to uh, um, social celebrities who are on uh, social media like MC Yama. So between Abby uh, and, and and her, they were able to get Hama's attention. And of course, MC Yama is uh, uh, of interest because he has he had demonstrated uh, interest in engineering and technology, uh, especially in the area of AI and even the idea of social justice in AI. And so we, we weren't, just uh, throwing dart uh, in the dark. We knew that this is potential interest uh, to to someone like him, and and he. We were grateful that he took it up and retweeted it. Great. So so let me move in uh, into a little bit about the actual uh, paper and what it discussed. Um, Perhaps, uh, Lola, you can talk uh, to us about the key problems that are listed in the paper. And then I'd like to move to uh, uh, both Noni and Marie to talk about some of the things that NIH has been thinking around this. Well, <laughs> the key problem is there is a funding gap uh, between white and black PIs, right? 
And, uh, you know, it, it, I know it sounds like either or, it's simply how the data was collected and benchmarked. Uh, with the white PI being sort of the norm and all other groups evaluated relative to that uh, racial group. And the data is out there, the data has been out there for over a decade. The funding rate, meaning the, um, uh, the um, frequency or the amount of time a black PI submits and gets funded is grossly uh, uh, behind the rate that you see for white uh, PI. So there's a funding disparity. That is, in my mind, the key problem that we highlight in that paper. Marie, um, perhaps you can give us your perspective of, you know, this is not a new problem that NIH just became aware of, um, but what, you know, I know you worked a lot, a long time in uh, trying to address some of the, the scientific workforce disparities. Yes, thank you for asking. Um, yes, I've been uh, recently dubbed a longtime NIH employee because I'm also the deputy director of the National Institute on Aging. And I guess that was last decade that I came in that role. Just since October, I've been the acting chief officer for scientific workforce diversity. But just the fact that there has been this position, a chief officer for scientific workforce diversity at NIH is representative of the fact that we recognize we have a problem. After the Ginter study came out, uh, Francis Collins uh, called on his advisory committee to help in thinking about what do we need to do to address this gap. Uh, and they made a number of recommendations, one of which was to establish a chief officer for scientific workforce diversity. And Dr. Hannah Valentine, who's now back at UCSF, was the founding um, Coswit, as we call it. She came in 2016, 2014, I'm sorry. Uh, and she left at the end of um, September of 2020. So I've had the privilege of being the acting Coswit uh, since that time. And there have been a number of efforts that have been launched, uh, in particular, um, something called the Diversity Program Consortium that's really focused on helping to fill the pathway of underrepresented scientists um, who uh, would be eligible for and competitive for all one equivalent grants. A lot of uh, careful uh, evaluation of the data uh, relative to the funding of underrepresented uh, scientists. Um, a recent study uh, led by Mike Lauer, who's the director of the Office of Extra World Research here at NIH, that found that uh, much of the disparity could be accounted for by the institute or center to which the grants got assigned. Five out of six of the most commonly assigned institutes for studies that were uh, uh, initiated by African American and Black scientists got assigned to uh, uh, um, institutes with lower success rates than other institutes. Um, so we've been looking at it very carefully and considering it very carefully. And then I'm really happy and excited about an initiative that we unveiled on February 26th um, that is specifically focused on this issue of structural racism and how it can be impacting scientists. It's something that we call UNITE. Uh, it was at, unveiled at a special meeting with the advisory committee to the director. Uh, it's something that we were working on for quite a while. Um, the George Floyd murder and the disproportionate deaths of underrepresented groups uh, with the COVID um, uh, pandemic has led to a lot of soul searching. So starting back in uh, June, lots of different meetings um, to think about how we should go about addressing these issues. And thank you for showing the website. Let me read to you that acknowledgement that Dr. Collins made on February 26th and got published on the website March 1st. He stated, to those individuals in the biomedical research enterprise who've endured disadvantages due to structural racism, I am truly sorry. NIH is committed to instituting new ways to support diversity, equity, and inclusion and identifying and dismantling any policies and practices at our own agency that may harm our workforce and our science. And it's just been marvelous to see the energy of the 80 plus NIH staffers who are involved with directly with the UNITE initiative, the real devotion of Francis Collins, the NIH director in accelerating the pace at which we address these issues the commitment to more money um, to support uh, 
uh, research in areas that many African American and Black scientists uh, tend to aggregate towards. Um, it's, it's an exciting time because there's a new energy and acceleration of things that um, I've only been at NIH for 13 years. There have been people here longer than me uh, and, and people who've been around for 20, 25, 30 years. So they've seen nothing akin to this in terms of the uh, energy and motivation that's there. So we're very hopeful. So, uh, you know, I think it was remarkable to, to hear NIH acknowledge um, structural racism. Uh, Lola and, and Hannah, as faculty members, you know, you've been in the trenches and seen this both firsthand and, and through um, the stories of your colleagues. Can you talk about, um, you know, some of the actual sort of examples or solutions that you uh, would like to see implemented at NIH? Maybe we can with with Hannah and um, go to Lola. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll mention the big one, uh, you know, uh, from our paper, and then Lola can uh, you know um, correct me and 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 um, enhance you know my answer. So uh, what we would really like to see is a targeted effort to fund black scientists akin to the early stage investigator program. Uh, we think it's possible uh, and we think it is the most straightforward, productive solution that needs that can be implemented now and give immediate results. Lola. Yeah, no, you, you are accurate. Um, certainly that that is the straightforward thing to do. And I would then add on to maintain the integrity of our scientific enterprise. We simply need to not be shy about saying something that NIH has on its website in many of its grant call and its mission, that diversity drives innovation. And if we're going to innovate uh, biotechnology, biomedical innovation that's going to be for all Americans. You just need diverse team, period. And so NIH has to put its money, uh, in my view, to, to where its words are. Um, if our mission at NIH is to uh, uh, supply a diverse biomedical workforce for the United States of America, we need to prioritize diverse team. Diverse team will make better technology. There is math around this that it shows how diversity of the people at the table enhances the solution that you generate. And so one of the key things that we highlight in the paper is simply this notion that we need to prioritize and fund teams that have diverse investigators in terms of gender, racial makeup, uh, background, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's level number two and then level number three uh, is to make it a, a squad driving criterion, right? We have studies that came out after the initial Ginter studies that shows quite clearly that part of the, or the major place where we see the disparity begin is when we rate um, the proposal and the criterion scores that we give. So by asking NIH to make a criterion score that actually forces reviewers to look at the diversity of the team with the science that backs up the idea that diverse team, it's not even an idea, it's, it's something that's been demonstrated over and over again, that diverse team uh, do better science, period. So that those are the three key things that, that we highlight uh, in the paper and ask NIH to consider doing. So maybe now I'll, I'll turn it over or sort of ask the question to, to Noni, uh, because as Lola mentioned, you know, one of the, the things that, of course, influences funding rates is um, both the review and perception of grants as they go through study section. And I know you've made a lot of um, progress and changes in that domain, but I would love to hear about, um, you know, what you think about the suggestions made in the, the paper, as well as sort of what we can expect to see in the future. Great. Yeah, thank you, Tejal, and, and thanks um, for inviting me to this. It's, uh, it's, it's an energetic conversation, and 
you know, uh, we have more to agree on than disagree on. Where we're, you know, we're trying to do the same things. Um, I think the funding disparity is something, as Marie mentioned, uh, that has been discussed um, and action plans put in place with NIH leadership. Action plans that look carefully um, at funding decisions as they're made and ensuring that there is a diversity of science um, uh, in, in all institutes. But from the review perspective, um, I think you're right. We, we, you know, as I'm looking at your, um, at the asks in that paper, and I'm going through them, a lot of them, I think, uh, one, I agree with them that we're already par either part way doing or starting to do, which is good, which is good to see because the paper then confirms and, and, um, and, and describes uh, to us sort of the urgency uh, of approaching this now. So uh, the first, you know, let me, let me first tackle um, diversifying review panels. I think the, the two places where I think you can have the most impact on the outcome of peer review and remove what I think of as structural um, racism that is out there. It's not simply in review, it's review is part of the, uh, of the external community, right? Our 18,000 reviewers are part um, of the community. Um, so a couple of places to prevent that, the impact of structural racism in peer review is to, blind, is to do blinded reviews, to not allow um, investigator or institutional uh, effects to show up in review. And we're exploring a number of ways in which we're doing that. Um, and positive bias is a real thing. Uh, I think anyone who's been on a review committee, uh, it, it's rare that you are rare or, or, or completely not happening that someone is saying this is an application from a black investigator. They may be thinking it, they're not saying it, but they say openly, this is an application from somebody big in the field who, who was a seminal leader or trained in this lab. And as we know, those networks are not where minorities uh, or, or blacks uh, are networked. And so there's this positive bias that's I think quite endemic in the entire community. Um, and we wanna protect peer review from that. So that's, that's one thing. Um, the concern about having um, a, a review criterion where you are, in essence, asking those same 18,000 reviewers who are part of your faculty, part of your institutions, to come in and assess whether, with, with, with the identifier still there. So they're assessing a grant from somebody famous uh, who they admire, they're impressed by the science or by the impact factor of the journal they publish. And these structural issues are you know, endemic. And then there's one criterion that says, is the team diverse? You know, it, it might make us feel good to put that in there. I, I have some doubts about the outcomes there, whether it'll actually change the outcome um, if it's just about that one score. Uh, we know there are many scores that don't change outcomes. Uh, you know, the uh, environment score, you know, you have applications from an HBCU or a minority serving institution. It might get a score of two, but you know that it doesn't matter because it's still gonna get rated um, worse in some ways because of the structural bias that's out there. So I think for me, my, uh, you know, our focus is to kind of do the bigger impact things first, take care of, um, uh, you know, looking at blinding and looking at really diversifying the voices around the table, uh, really preventing our staff, uh, just like our staff are just like anybody else in the field. All of us are that way. Um, looking at our mental Rolodex when we recruit, right? Who do I know in the field? And the people you know are usually the people who are connected and networked. We do that when we put together working groups, uh, you know, if you're an editor and you're looking for reviewers. Um, so it's a part of sort of internal uh, culture change and providing tools for SROs to really broaden uh, the review uh, panels. And we've made tremendous progress there. Um, and um, and looking at blinding and review. I think those are the two highest impact things we can do. So. Yeah, I mean, so it's it's great to hear that, uh, you know, NIH is working on, on many of these um, uh, initiatives, uh, and I'm delighted uh, to hear that NIH does also see concerns uh, as was highlighted in the paper. Uh, but 
I think <laughs> NIH sometimes under underappreciates the leverage and power it has in directing how we function on the academic side. Uh, the quickest way to get a faculty member to do anything is to say NIH requires it now. Uh, in fact, I just went through fixing my bio sketch and I just devoted two hours to doing that today because NIH said I have to do it. Uh, and so there is some aspect of uh, just the recognition that if NIH can, in a very forceful way, communicate that they truly deeply believe this very thing they've said in multiple locations on their website, that we will prioritize diverse team and we will use it as an avenue to allocate funds, university investigators uh, uh, will comply. They will work harder uh, to generate diverse team. And I will promise you, any team, any proposal that is led by Black PI is automatically a diverse team. Right, because right now, the only way many of those proposals, in fact, one of the heartbreaking conversation on Facebook that pushed us was a fellow colleague, a black woman saying that in this moment, I'm cutting and pasting my R01 grant into a white male colleague's grant. Okay, so I think there is that recognition that NIH should have of the ways it impacts how things are done. And I would argue that the fact that NIH has not pushed institution, that's part of why many of our institutions in STEM in particular, have remained non-diverse in their faculty. There is no external force. They are still all getting the cash flow from the NIH and many of the uh, federal agencies with, without impunity, right? So that's sort of why we say, yes, let's push this thing uh, even though I hear the concern on the um, NIH side of whether um, those things will actually move the needle or not, but this is actually some of those things we should probably try. Let's do it. So, and Marie could add to this. We, we you know, there is a, a trial uh, or a pilot out there with the Brain Initiative uh, that has, you know, that just came out over the last uh, a few weeks. Uh, where the diversity plan, diversity of team, diverse perspectives plan, I can't remember what exactly it's called, uh, is being tried out. So I'd be interested to see how that works. What comes out on the other end in review? There are two different things I think we're talking about, right? One is effecting culture change by requiring PIs to prepare something and submit with the application. The other is relying on the 18,000 reviewers, you know, who are out there to actually make solid assessments of that. Those are two different things. Uh, I think I agree with the former. Uh, I'm a little skeptical um, of, of the latter, but it'll be interesting to see how this pilot works out. Yeah, and I can add to that, that um, yeah, we are very evidence-based and so everyone's very interested in this pilot and what the results show and what are the generalizable principles. Sometimes the things that we think really are gonna work well don't prove to work as well as we'd hoped. Uh, we have another um, uh, experiment that's out there, the Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation. It was announced in December of 2020. The first set of cohorts um, submitted their applications uh, March of this year. We expect to get the first group funded by the end of this fiscal year. And this is looking to test what already has been tested internally at NIH. Uh, a lot of the work that Hannah Valentine did, and let me correct it, she was at, she's at Stanford, not at UCSF. Uh, for me on the East Coast, you know, they kind of get pushed together, but <laughs> um, the, um, what, what Hannah did as the Coswood was to build a wonderful foundation of evidence, uh, looking at making sure that we were transparent uh, and clear about uh, how we're going to go about uh, searches, making sure that we had long list of, un, you know, from unbiased searches that had lots of extra people for consideration for recruitment for jobs, um, that the uh, intramural research program leaders, the scientific directors on a regular basis report the demographics of their program and, and get feedback about that um, to look for making change, and that cohorts of individuals are recruited who are 
focused on diversity and have a track record of diversity. And what's been demonstrated as a result of that is a really nice uptick in the diversity of um, uh, scientists in the tenure track within the NIH intramural program. So that evidence is now being applied in the first initiative. Um, NIH is sufficiently impressed that some $250 million approximately is going to be dedicated to this over the course of the next 10 years, uh, nine years. Um, and we can look at, you know, is this truly as effective outside of NIH as it was inside of NIH? And if it is, what are the generalizable principles that we can apply in all of our funding opportunity announcements? So. I'm excited about this. I think it's going to work. It's looking for culture change. And the Unite uh, groups, particularly the E group that's looking at the extramural ecosystem is excited by this and looking at how that can be adapted and more generally disseminated. Um, so I, I think that going forward in an evidence-based fashion to try to make the change that we would like to see is you know, the NIH tradition. Can I, can I jump in just for a second to go back to um, one of the points that Noni made about de-identifying um, uh, de the, the, uh, the, the grants uh, during review? Um, and, and I want to be a little bit, uh, you know, um, uh, con not confrontational, but a little bit aggressive in, in pushing on that point. In this, so I, I have been reviewing for NIH for a very long time. And in my field, I can guarantee you that I can guess probably 80% of who wrote a grant in my study section with their institution removed, with their name removed, even with the references removed. Um, from the, the narrative, from the reference to the previous work, and what they emphasize and the knowledge base they refer to. So I am, uh, you know, so I think in the, you know, given the urgency with which that we need to act and the fact there might not exist a perfect solution, I think it behooves us to try a lot of them and not wait for years until you know, we do study after study on, 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 on these issues. I think we, we, we have to think outside the box and try different things simultaneously. Yeah, so and, I, and I'm go gonna ahead. quickly re, re, re paraphrase my colleague, uh, Pam Kreger. If NIH doesn't trust the reviewers to do the job, maybe NIH should do it. Why not NIH prioritize funding diverse teams? right? You have the data, you, or you have means of collecting the data. Let the reviews do what they need to do. And then when we fund, especially this idea of select pay, right? This is the discretions that institutes have. And we see, in fact, how the select pay ways that it's being used right now actually uh, <laughs> expands the disparity. Whereas after a certain uh, percentile score, the bulk of the grants that are picked selectively are led by white PIs. Why not have NIH do the job if they don't trust reviewers uh, to, to be able to, to prioritize diverse team? So let me, let me address first uh, Hannah's point about, about blinding. Uh, I, I don't think it's aggressive at all. I mean, we've obviously, the science is not easy to uh, to blind, right? We, we, we all fields. Um, CSR just finished and is, is about to publish the, the largest study of blinding in NIH peer review. And in that one, what we found was around 20% uh, of the reviewers were able to identify correctly the PI. Uh, we're currently just, it, it, this one is not a pilot, it's an actual blinded review that was done for the Common Fund Transformative R01 programs. And there too, I believe it's 20 to 25% of the reviewers were able to identify despite redaction. So there is, there is definitely, you're right. One thing that does not happen in when, when an application is blind, and there are better ways to do it, and I'm sure we'll learn from this latest um, uh, review that we did. Um, but one thing that will not happen is that you are not able, you, you can't bias the whole panel. So you internally might know, okay, this is an application from Dr. Famous. 
and I'm going to give it a two. You can't then stay, sit in front of the whole panel and say, this is an application from Dr. Famous, which is, you know, and he'll, in his hands, this will work. How many times have we heard that? Uh, that kind of stuff will not affect the rest of the panel. I think there is value uh, to, to partially double blinding and, and allowing that to, I'm interested to see, it's not a long-term project. It's not something that we're gonna wait years to see. We'll see it soon. The evaluation is occurring now. And by September, we should have it. Um, so, so I do think that there's some value to exploring that. Uh, it, it's very positive bias is is endemic in peer review. Um, so, so yeah, one so thing I wanted to, to come back to is, um, you know, yes, positive bias is is something that I think we all can agree with. Uh, but a lot of the dynamics happen within the the study section, and, and Lola mentioned the PM or the the program officers who are able to make sort of the gray zone decisions. Um, is that, you know, in my mind, that is a place where um, there can be uh, a lot of improvement or at least uh, an innovation of what are ways in which we can intervene. Your thoughts on that? Uh, but Lola, if you want to expand on that as well as um, Noni. Yeah, no, I, I love to, to hear um, how NIH is thinking or rethinking about that. Right. So uh, I don't know if Marie wants to take it, but let me let me just uh, simply say that when the discussions were happening nationally after the after the George Floyd murder, you you talked about that. They were also happening internally. You know, there was a lot of soul searching, and this was very much a part of that discussion. Um, there's a heightened level of awareness. I think every, um, you know, Francis has made it very clear to every institute director that, um, you know, a, a fair uh, process and, and fairness and consistency in discretionary funding decisions is important. Um, and, and there's a lot of data uh, that has been provided. So that's, I mean, I don't do any funding, so that's as far as I know, but I'll pass it on to Marie. Yes, I'd be happy to elaborate on that. Um, there is a thorough cultural change that we're looking to make internally as well as externally. Part of that internal cultural change, every, there is mandatory implicit bias training now for all NIH staff to sensitize them to the issues that can lead to lack of diversity and lack of inclusiveness in their approaches to things. Uh, we've gotten started in doing uh, some you know, baseline foundational training for leadership, which is going to pass on to others about issues with regards to racial equity. All the institute directors and deputy directors and scientific directors and clinical directors and executive officers, all the top people leading things have now gone through six hours of training um, about racial equity so that they can be more sensitized. And we anticipate that by the beginning of this coming fiscal year, um, our fiscal year begins October 1, in the performance standard of every institute director will be the expectation that they are going to be performing with regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that includes issues with regards to diversity of the researchers that they fund, diversity of the staff that they have, diversity of the people that they invite for talks, that um, they nominate for awards, all of those sorts of things. And if it's in the Institute Director's Performance Plan, it cascades down to everyone else with that expectation. So even that uh, program officer who's at the funding meeting and has um, you know, the opportunity to uh, express uh, support for some, some grant that's in the gray zone, they will be more sensitized to thinking about thinking more broadly than their usual mental Rolodex of individuals. So uh, again, I remain very optimistic um, that we're going to see some significant changes, um, but it, it will take a little bit of time. It won't be next week. I do, so, so want, like to, uh, I do want to real go quick ahead. go back to this idea of positive bias. I think we all agree uh, with uh, Noni that this is something that needs to be fixed. It is one of the many thing, examples that we hear all the time. In fact, we had conversation in our Slack group this morning about this. 
But it is important that the audience understands that while that will have an impact, it's unlikely to significantly impact this funding disparity for Black PIs. Why do I say that? The total amount, number of PIs that are Black that are submitted into the NIH are very tiny. So positive bias is really only going to move things around amongst the majority PIs, right? Where the super famous who used to get all the funding may get maybe one less grant funded and it goes to a mid-level person who's also going to be a member of the majority uh, funded. So I think it goes back to what my colleague Hannah said in the beginning of this conversation. There needs to be a parallel track where we are simply in the immediate correcting the funding disparity and, and making sure we're getting grants onto the hands of people who are in the pipeline right now, who are going to leave the pipeline if we don't do something now. Great. So I'd like to, to pivot a little bit to get some of the audience questions, because um, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, chat going on. Uh, but one of the questions that has come up um, uh, is in regard to really thinking about um, the comment that, you know, if diversity creates better science, um, does the NIH also consider racism as a public health problem and, and perhaps having a dedicated institute that could focus uh, on this issue is very important in public health. Um, any, any thoughts to that? I'd be happy to take that. We have the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and they do take the lead with regards to issues with regards to structural racism. And in fact, as part of the UNITE initiative, we announced on February 26th that we intended to have robust support for funding opportunity announcement that NIMHD, as we call them, was developing. Uh, as of March 23rd, I believe that RFA came out with support of 25 institute centers and offices, a commitment of up to $30.8 million um, to pursue that. Uh, additionally, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, that is the lead in training grants from NIH, uh, published a notice of special interest in middle of uh, March in projects looking at the impact of structural racism on biomedical career progression. Uh, et cetera. So we are clearly interested in that. We clearly have an institute that takes the lead on that and we'll be really anxious to see what comes from these initiatives. And then we also have a, a question, which I, I also, I, we actually talked about this uh, before we got on to this panel about um, the fact that the group that really has been uh, providing um, the efforts and the movement uh, have been female led and also mostly female. Uh, and then, you know, kind of this panel, of course, reflects that as well. And uh, I, I think we we're interested to hear about how that um, has impacted the work, um, has um, coalesced the community, or other thoughts around that. Yeah, you know, I think. A, we're biomedical engineers, and naturally women are still also underrepresented in our discipline. So it was a natural fit that when <laughs> black women faculty are crying, the people next to them who would truly uh, understand some aspect of that are going to be their other women colleagues because there is similarities, not quite the same, but similarities in some of the uh, issues that they deal with. Uh, as well. Uh, and so that's sort of how we we were a group of women who um, got together naturally because of the fact that we're underrepresented. Let me tell you, when I'm on Facebook or on Slack, I feel like I'm being hugged by 200 women. I can't possibly achieve that if I stood in the middle of my uh, building in my university, because there aren't that many women um, faculty or colleagues around me. Uh, so, so there is a necessity in terms of finding a community that's important in terms of many of us being able to persevere in this discipline, right? Uh, and so it's, it's easier to collaborate and, and, and generate ideas when you, when you find yourself in, in that kind of group. Uh, anything to add? 
Yeah, no, I'm, what, what I love about this group is the intersectionality of it. The fact that we understand each other's struggle and we are willing to support each other through multiple of these issues that, uh, you know, that are mo many of them women in academia issue, women in STEM issue. And the fact that uh, for me, that through this group, I came to understand how women of color specifically are an endangered species in STEM fields. Uh, the other thing I would like to mention very briefly is that the general Slack channel now has many men allies uh, who are there and participating. So, uh, and we hope to expand that also. Okay, um, so I want to turn the, the next question to um, Noni and Marie. Um, there's a lot of um, enthusiasm for your willingness to share your perspective here today. Uh, and is there, I, I guess the question is, is there anything that we as a community, uh, both this community and, and others can do to help you uh, in your roles at NIH and to, to really push for this funding, uh, addressing the funding disparity? So I will start off by saying, uh, first of all, for those of you who did respond to the RFI that was put out by Unite, thank you. It's going to be really important information in helping us as we're moving forward. We have more than a thousand responses from individuals, institutions, organizations. So it's going to take us a little while to go through it all, but it's going to really help us in thinking about what we need to do going forward. There are going to be listening sessions uh, coming up and we really encourage you to populate those and continue to give us feedback. And as we said, February 26th, when we announced this initiative, we said, this is a marathon, not a sprint. We're trying to rectify things that have been placed for ages. And um, so um, I, in fact, said it was an ultra marathon. Some folks didn't like that, but it's, that's the reality. <laughs> um, so what are the mile markers? How do you know that you've accomplished anything? Um, when we go to the advisory committee to the director meetings every June and December, we're being held accountable to talk about what it is that we've accomplished and what are the next things that need to be accomplished to get to the point we'd like to be. And so please, we have a, an advisory committee to the director meeting coming up June 10th and 11th tune in or watch the video cast after the fact, give feedback, um, and you know, plan on it every June and December and keep us uh, to task. Noni? Yeah, great, thank you. And, and thanks for the opportunity to engage. You know, last, last summer we held uh, three uh, listening sessions at CSR from the community. Those were remarkably helpful, I feel, uh, for me. Uh, and, and I appreciate, uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, I think the, the right now for us, the biggest way you could help CSR is to connect us to communities to broaden our pool of reviewers. We are actively reaching out to every URM early stage investigator, for example, and inviting them to come to a forum to talk to us about how the early career reviewer program works. Um, so, so we're doing direct outreach, but I know that there are networks uh, you know, and unfortunately, our networks are are not as diverse as we'd like them to be. So, if you have networks, uh, the Slack sounds great, but I, uh, you know, I, I'm happy to um, be connected up to those networks so we can broaden our our pool of reviewers uh, from which we draw. We are pushing hard. Okay, we have a, we have a couple more questions. One of the the questions. Uh, that has popped up is it appears that um, NIM HD Institute um, has the smallest budget appropriation, uh, at least according to Wikipedia. Uh, are there plans to expand that budget or, you know, given that as Marie said, uh, it is the center of really looking at some of these issues around structural racism? So uh, we are members of the executive branch and uh, the executive branch, the president puts forward a budget and then uh, Congress uh, makes their decisions and Congress makes the decisions about allocations for each of the institutes and centers. So um, we as government employees cannot make statements about you should do X, Y, or Z, but you as uh, citizens can do whatever you'd like in terms of uh, talking with uh, Congress about these sorts of things. I will say that part of 
the reason that there was the commitment to a common fund initiative uh, announced on February 26th when Unite was unveiled. Uh, we, we had this concept of doing more in the way of health disparities, health equity research. Uh, it was approved and a commitment of $60 million for that. The first two funding opportunities related to that um, using this fiscal year's funds came out on March 26. Um, half of the funds are to go to um, just transformative research and health disparities and health equities. Half of the funds are targeted towards minority serving institutions. And uh, it'll be, as I said, up to $24 million. The other 36 million will be in fiscal year 23. That is a means of amplifying the impact of a small institute like NIMHD. The fact that there were 25 institute centers and offices that signed on to the NIMHD-led initiative on structural racism markedly amplified what it is that they are able to do. Um, so even though they may be the smallest in terms of budget appropriation, there are opportunities that are being you know, definitely taken advantage of to amplify the issues that uh, they lead. I do want to say that, you know, I'm deeply delighted uh, with all the calls uh, that NIH has had and the fact that they built this concept into the UNITE program. But it is still very important that we don't focus only on having uh, Black PIs work in funding disparity work only, and we, we push money there. There is an important need for diverse researchers um, in the mainstream, so to speak, uh, science and medical research and technology research uh, that's happening in the United States. Technology that we make on the engineering side is meant for all Americans, but there are so many evidence out there of technology that is out there that's approved, that's being used, that you could tell was not done um, in consideration of all Americans, right? And those technologies are not usable for people like me. And so it is important that again, the funding disparity affects black PIs broadly. We need black and brown uh, PIs working in biomedical engineering, in neuroengineering, in, you know, OBGYN, right? So one piece is elevating health disparity as a major public health issue. I'm glad NIH is doing that. NIH still needs to also recognize this issue of having a diverse team doing the science that is to produce technology for our nation. Okay, we're, we're sure on time, but I thought I would end with one last question and then have you um, maybe say a few comments to, to close. Um, this is coming from uh, Joel Finbloom. Uh, how was the overall impact score determined for NIH grants? I was surprised when um, it was mentioned that a good environment score won't matter much. Maybe so I can send me. this to, to I'm the one who said that. And, and there are a lot of uh, experienced reviewers uh, right here on this panel who will tell you as well the overall impact score is supposed to be a holistic evaluation of the impact of the work and is not a mathematical computation based on uh, the criteria score. Uh, studies that have been done uh, thus far have shown that mostly it's driven by um, evaluation of the approach. Um, and we know uh, that, that uh, at least from, from what we've seen is that the score of the environment is not a big driver of the overall impact score. That's enough. Okay. Yes. Um, so I know actually there, there's many other questions and comments um, that we won't have time to get, but I, I really wanted to thank you all for your time. And maybe um, if you want us to say a few words to uh, conclude, uh, we can start with uh, uh, Noni and then go around. Right. So, so my, you know, the words I would have to conclude is that the interest of CSR is in identifying the strongest science. Um, and we can't do that without diversity on the committees. And I, you know, it, it won't happen. Um, uh, we get mostly, we'll get derivative science to, to identify the most innovative science. We need diverse teams of reviewers. Um, so that's where I think there's some questions about, uh, about the need for diversity around panels. 
uh, and that's what's driving it. Thank you. All right. Well, I would like to say thank you so much for this stimulating discussion. Um, we really uh, welcome the opportunity for further interactions through the UNITE initiative, through the Scientific Workforce Diversity Office. Uh, we believe that the changes that we are trying to make are going to enhance the quality of the science, the uh, creativity, the innovation. Our job is to look at what the barriers are and to remove them so that we can have true equity for all. So thank you for the op opportunity for the conversation and looking forward to further engagement. And maybe we can uh, end with some comments from Lola and then Hannah to wrap this I panel up. I, you know, I, I again, I'm deeply grateful for this opportunity and for the NIH to join us. And, and I'm delighted to, to see some of the things that is going on with UNITE as well as the CSR. That's fantastic. But I, I, I have to uh, sound like a broken record here. This is an important problem. Uh, I think the pandemic and how it's unfolded in our nation is a great example of America not having leveraged the full force of its human capital because we keep leaving our black and brown humans off the table. We don't we don't have the robust workforce that we could get because of some of these disparities that we're talking about. We are the greatest nation in the world, but we are not meeting that bar because again, you have this funding disparity. I, I recognize that NIH is, is one that we know of and there are many other agencies that likely have these issues that we just simply don't have the data. It is important that we fix this issue and we fix it now. Any more studying would be good, but we'll end up continuing to bleed the pipeline. And, and the, the more we defer it to the future, the harder it becomes to fix the, the problem. Uh, and the far behind the US will fall in terms of uh, global competition. So this is an important problem. And we, we are asking that NIH find as many opportunities and ways to, to start fixing it now. And I'll just jump very quickly and, 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 and say that I do hope, and we all do hope that the NIH treats this as, as, as they've treated the pandemic. Uh, we didn't understand everything there is to understand about SARS-CoV-2 before we got a vaccine. We jumped into action. So I hope we jump into action rapidly, swiftly on this epidemic too. Wonderful. Yeah, I too think um, hopefully we can jump into action uh, together, uh, both NIH and, and academia, and figure out how to really best support the future of science and engineering. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for the audience. Um, really, really appreciate your uh, engagement, and um, hopefully the conversation uh, will not only continue, but also we will make action happen. Have a good afternoon. Thank you all. Bye.